live. Hello, welcome to the This Is Not Therapy Hour. I am Brandon Tessers. I'm a licensed therapist, but this is not therapy for so very, very many reasons. Um, I am <laughs> in a rush today, frazzled. Uh, this is an unusual time for this. I don't know if anybody's even going to be here because I only announced the shifted time for this week and for next week at the beginning of last week's stream. So anybody who wasn't watching that doesn't know. I probably need to work on like having a better way to get information out to people about this. But if you are here, I appreciate you. Um, today is unusual. We're doing this today because tomorrow I am flying for the first time since December of 2019 uh, with my family, including a baby that we did not have the last time that we were on a plane. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot to do. Um, and then next week, instead of Wednesday at one o'clock, I like our normal time. Next week will be Thursday at one o'clock to two o'clock central time. So next week will also be unusual because we're flying back next Wednesday. Uh, after that, we'll be back to normal. Um, this is the this is not therapy hour. It's just an open conversation until and unless somebody's in chat saying things to me directly, which I really appreciate whenever that happens, happens most weeks. And I appreciate you. Uh, but until that happens, I'm having a conversation with people that I'm only imagining might be here, which is not as fun or as valuable for the people who are here because I'm just having to make a lot of guesses about who might be here and how something might be interpreted by them and what might be helpful. But that's still better than not doing anything, I think. Um, what else? I run a therapy and executive functioning coaching practice called Effective Artistry. That's our fun logo up there in the corner. We do individual couples, family therapy. We do individual executive functioning coaching. We also are developing groups, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't really feel like doing this spiel today. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about a topic. I actually have one in mind today that I thought would be interesting or helpful or relevant, or maybe really I just mean I've been thinking about it, and so it seemed useful to me to talk about it here. Uh, but if you're here and you're in the chat, we go wherever you want to go. It doesn't matter if we stay on the topic that we start with or not. We're going to go wherever. I think that's pretty much most important stuff. And if not, I apologize. Actually, this isn't what I was going to talk about, but a concept that I think is potentially helpful. Um, I call it juggling which is when your working memory is full, right? Which it always is, but uh, you have finite space, finite ability, limited ability to be aware of something. And awareness, attention is about things coming into awareness. Awareness is short-term storage, holding. Once we, we pay attention to a thing and become aware of it, we can stay aware of it without having to pay attention and get new information about it. Actually, I guess this is relevant to what I wanted to talk about today. When everything that is in your working memory feels important to you, because there's really only two ways out of working memory, either something is forgotten or it is processed into long term memory. And the vast, vast, vast majority of things are forgotten because it takes a lot to process it into long term memory for later retrieval. So it's a big bottleneck. And what we're trying to do with most of that information all the time is determine whether it's useful and use it before we forget it so that we can use it, be done with it, and then forget it, you know, let go of it. It's done. We don't need that information anymore. Not, oh, crap, I forgot something that's important somehow. So what I talk about, what I say, when I say juggling, what I mean is everything that you're aware of feels important. And I'm not talking consciously. These aren't fully conscious processes, right? But everything you're aware of has either been deemed to be important or as uh, potentially important. I haven't had a chance to really think about it and delve into it and resolve it yet, so I can't lose it, right? And then you become aware of something new that is also important. So it bumps something out. There has to be space made for it. One particular way that this can happen instead of just forgetting it, what I call juggling is, okay, just visualizing this space, right? I need to clear up room, so I'm gonna throw this one out, but I'm not throwing it away. I'm just throwing it up in the air. And in its place, I'm leaving a little marker to say, remember, there was something here. 
sometimes that marker is just a nagging voice of like there was something I was supposed to. Sometimes the marker is bigger. It's something about packing for the trip or something about whatever, or it's something and it came up when I was in the kitchen. I thought I needed something from here. And then we take that marker and we try and get back to what is it that we're trying to you know, remember. But to do that, we have to re-expand that and take up the space, which means something else gets bumped out. But that's also not something we want to forget. So it gets thrown away and replaced with a little marker that we re-expand. So I call it juggling because it's kind of like I've got too much to carry in my hands and I'm expanding my ability to carry more than I can physically hold in my hands by throwing something in the air. So at any given time, one thing is stored in the air, but it's coming back down. So I got to throw the other and I got to throw the other and I got to throw the other. I think it's a it's a, an experience that people generally are familiar with. You know, talking about it this way resonates with most people. The idea of I feel like there's so much going on, like I can only look at one thing at a time, but I can't even really get that thing done because in order to do something with that thing, I have to expand and spend more of my awareness and working memory on it. And in order to do that, I have to drop a bunch of other stuff, but I can't lose that other stuff either. It's a very common like joke about ADHD, but not just about ADHD, where people say I have so much to do that I can't get anything done, right? So anyway, I'm juggling a little bit right now. <laughs> Not a little bit, a lot. I got a lot of stuff in the air that I'm like, okay, can't forget about prepping for this. Can't forget about communicating with that person. Can't forget about whatever. And I have to re-expand it and get into it. And it makes it hard to transition in and out of things because to get into this in the depth and detail to make the room for it that I need to make in order to actually do it instead of just be aware of it as something I need to do or want to do, I have to drop other things. And yes, I have my strategies and my offloading systems and all that, although I'll be perfectly honest that like many married people, especially uh, cishet men married to cishet women, that that division of labor, which is inherent in any partnership, there should be a division of labor, there should be specialization. What would be the point of any partnership if both people were doing everything that the other person was doing? But in this case, it's very common that women in this culture end up doing more of the tracking things through where men get to be like, I'm going to do this thing now and just not worry about what needs to be done next. So, but she is also juggling because we are both overwhelmed. <laughs> so I like saying I'm juggling better than saying I'm frazzled or I'm scattered or whatever. It just, to me, it's more, well, it's like we talk about all the time, language development, right? We can make a connection between anything as long as we can make a connection between it. So if I connect the concept of juggling to this, now all that information I just gave you is contained within the concept of juggling for me. So I can say juggling and it means all that. Whereas if I say scattered, I don't have as clearly defined or as, easy, uh, as easily um, shared way of dealing with that concept. I have a, an experience that I feel like, yeah, I'm feeling scattered and the word scattered is evocative and hopefully gives a sense of what I'm talking about, but not the same kind of level of detail. I like things to be precise. So I'm juggling. Anyway, the thing I was thinking about talking about, and that is kind of relevant today, is I like to call it the three A's. Let me clarify this just for myself. Nobody's asked this or needs this or cares, but I care, I guess, because I worry. Well, this is another thing we could talk about, too, that even though I don't think it's likely that anybody cares, the idea that somebody would care and I not say it is so bad that it's worth doing something, spending some resources to address it, even though it's so unlikely because of how bad I think I would feel about it or think about it. And I've taken myself off of my line. What was I going to say? Um, for myself, oh, right, <laughs> that in like marketing, right, in trying to tell people about what you're doing in a way, you know, that, that you think they might want to spend some money on, there's all this about branding and effectively, it's about putting big complex things behind very simple little markers quick phrase, a logo, a whatever, and connecting those things to the bigger, more complex stuff. And I think of that as like cheesy and corny because it's marketing and I don't like marketing and I don't like people trying to sell things and blah, blah, blah. 
but it is effectively the same as what we're talking about. If I am trying to share a concept, not for the purpose of making money off of it, but for the purpose of, I think it's useful to share. I still want to be able to take that concept and wrap it up and connect it to something simple and easy to remember. But then when I do that, I will often feel like silly because, oh man, this sounds like I'm trying to like write a book on business productivity or whatever, you know, sell a, a course or whatever. It's just that they're both the same processes. You want simple and easy to remember and easy to express things that connect to large, complex things to make it more efficient. All that being said, this next thing I'm going to talk about, I call it the three A's <laughs> because it's easier for me to remember things that are alliterative. I think that's generally true for people, but acquisition, arrangement, application. And what we're talking about is the brain as an information management system. A lot of what we talk about is that the brain is an information management system, which is not at all the only thing or even the most important thing that the brain does, but it is the biggest part of what we're all aware of, because that's what consciousness is a part of, is information management. Kind of the whole point of executive functioning is to say consciousness awareness we're managing information we can even come up with ideas of what to do with that information but that an executive functioning is the part of the brain the processes that are then take that intention and translate it into actual specific instructions for something to be done with consciousness is just information not action i am silencing this because it is too hard for me today to keep track of many different things all at once Acquisition, arrangement, application. And the basics of it is this. You can acquire data from the environment as filtered through your sensory organs, your sensation, and your perceptual processes. If we're talking about consciousness, which just to be aware, this whole thing is about what we are thinking, not stuff that we don't notice, right? You can acquire information from the environment through sensation and perception. So there's some bottlenecks there. Once you have information, you can arrange and rearrange and rearrange and rearrange it, including by pulling things up from long-term memory that you know about, especially things that are, we don't need to get into like recognition versus recall, but especially things that seem to be brought up because of whatever thing that you just acquired from the environment until you come up with an arrangement that you say, okay, yes, this seems like a worthwhile way of looking at this. This seems like a good idea. I'm going to try this, do this, say this, whatever. And then it's application. We take that arrangement and we apply it to whatever in whatever way. And it's a cycle. And like all these things, it's a construct, which means we couldn't actually say, this is arrangement, this is application, because it's it just depends on how you define it, right? It's useful to be able to break things into these three components and specifically to be able to talk about the cycle of acquiring data, arranging data, and applying data. But we could look at any given thing and call it arrangement or application or whatever, right? The point, the reason I find this to be useful, number one primarily is you don't generate data in your head. You don't. Nobody does. That's not what we do. That's not what it is. You don't come up with new information whole cloth. You do, everybody does all the time, come up with new arrangements of information uniquely suited to whatever thing you're thinking about or trying to do that nobody's ever come up with that arrangement before. But you can't break that down into component pieces at a fundamental level and point at a component where it's, you generated this completely. If for no other reason than because your thoughts are mediated by, mediated, it's not the right word. Um, thinking is about symbolic representation, right? And you didn't make up your own symbols. So whatever experiences you're having, the elements of those experiences that you notice and how you think of them and how you remember them is all gated through language. Language, not just in like spoken word, but symbolic representation. So we don't make up stuff in our head. We just combine and recombine, arrange and rearrange stuff that we have acquired either in the moment or long ago that's stored in long-term memory until we come up with something that we apply. That particular piece I think is very important for, excuse me, for a lot of people because we have a tendency to think 
that if we just think longer and harder, surely we'll come up with an answer. Surely we'll come up with something. This is what we call magical thinking, right? That even though every arrangement I can come up with still leaves gaps, that doesn't make sense. That wouldn't work. There's something missing here. There's no arrangement I can come up with that's like, oh yes, A then B then, yeah, yeah, that would work, right? Or at least I don't, I see no reason to think it wouldn't work. Um, but we can get like, okay, well, here's A to F, and then I cannot figure out what to do next, but here's K and then on. So I just need something to fill that gap, which is great if we then go back to the environment and try and acquire new information, new data, look for something that fits that gap and connects the first piece to the second piece. But we often, especially neurodivergent people, especially the kind of people that, that I work with frequently, help, especially myself, we often will get stuck in a place where we're like, ah, oh, there's this gap and I need something to fit in there. So let me just think harder and harder and harder and harder and longer and longer and longer and longer and surely I'll come up with something. We do that because it's true. We, we do come up with things. It's still just different arrangements of things, right? But something I find useful to help right, to share with people is diminishing returns, the law of diminishing returns. In this case, the way I'm applying it, we're talking about it means every unit of a resource that you spend toward a goal moves you less uh, was no, let me rephrase that. Every unit of a resource that you spend in pursuit of a goal returns less value than the previous unit of that resource that you spent in pursuit of that goal. You spend an hour on a thing, you're going to make more progress than you make in the next hour. And you'll make more progress in that hour than you make in the next. So the longer, the more you throw something, you throw at something, the slower and slower your progress gets. And I don't think, I mean, we're just creating models and constructs here, right? So I think it's useful to think of it as like exponential growth that never quite gets parallel and flattens and there's no point in trying, but it quickly gets to a point where you can spend the rest of your life thinking about it. You're not going to get much out of that, right? It's just, it's a helpful way, I think, to remind people to get out of their heads and go find information instead of just thinking that they can make it up. Back in the day when I was a tutor, test prep tutor, when I was putting myself through undergrad, um, we talked about this a lot for SAT and ACT, where people taking tests will read the question, come up with an answer, and choose the answer. But in the process of choosing that answer, they look at the other answer choices and then they start to think, huh, maybe it's this other thing, right? So then we stop and we think about it. Which one is it? Is it this or is it that? Is it this or is it that? Or sometimes it'll be, I can't come up with an answer. I've looked at everything I have. I've looked at the answer choices and I have no idea, but I'm still going to look at it anyway. Think, think, think. I can come up with something. I can come up with something. And it's a waste. Because it is true that sometimes if you think, 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 you can get it. Or if you choose one answer but see another answer choice and be like, wait, maybe that is. Sometimes you can make that shift. But the longer you spend doing that, the less likely it becomes that spending more time is going to accomplish that for you. So what feels good, like subjectively, your internal experience of thing, what feels good for people is to have this cycle move quickly. I'm getting data thinking about the data and using the way that I've rearranged that data, applying that data, which then I apply it, I do something and I observe what happens, which is acquiring more data and coming up with new arrangement. The faster that we get that cycle going, the better we feel. To the point that I think one helpful way to talk about things like flow state or being in the zone is just that that cycle is moving so quickly that we can't even really consciously observe the arrangement part of it like we normally do we normally are aware of our thinking but sometimes when you are for example i don't know snowboarding is a thing that i used to do have not <laughs> have not done much for a long time but when you're snowboarding when you're walking right you're picking up information about the environment utilizing that information to then instruct your body what to do with it but if you're doing it so quickly that you can't even really notice what you're thinking Oh, I should lean back a little bit here. And of course, just to be clear, I'm talking about consciousness, right? There are things we do with no thinking whatsoever. And even snowboarding could be that if you 
do it enough and especially on certain runs and whatever that it just kind of becomes something that your body can do without any thinking involved at all. But I think generally that's not what we're talking about when we talk about flow state and peak experiences or being in the zone or whatever that kind of stuff is, because a lot of what people report in those moments, particularly that separates them from any other kind of like physical activity that draws your attention to the environment. So you're not thinking about it is that it is still, it's notable that you're not thinking people report. It's like, it's like things are just happening. I'm not thinking about anything. I'm not having to make anything happen. Or a lot of the times what you'll hear is people say things like, it's like anything I think I want to do this or I want this to happen, and then it just does. So there's still thinking involved, but not in the execution piece, at least not noticeably. Anyway, so that's one of the reasons I've, or that, those are the two major reasons I use this particular framework. One is to help people to remind themselves Hey, I can't do this by myself in my head forever. I got to, if I'm getting stuck, I got to go get something. One of the phrases that my mentor, Andy Mahoney, would share with me is if you're feeling stuck with a client, go back to assessment. Meaning, if you don't know what to do next, get more information. And I think that's just a generally good rule for everything all over the place. You don't know what to do next, get more information. You don't know what to do next get more information. Now that's not always possible. And when that's the case, you got to just make a choice about what to do based on the information you have. And that's more about becoming comfortable with the idea that you cannot predict with certainty exactly how things will go. I think this, I mean, I don't know, take it back to the SAT, A, B, C, D, E, right? No, it's been so long since I've tutored, I can't remember. SAT has five answer choices, ACT has four, I think, but I could be getting that backwards. Anyway, A, B, C, D, E, I don't know. B, I guess, right? That's great. B, I guess. Let's move along. Sometimes a lot of what we're talking about, just generally in this work, is to be comfortable with and be aware of, and then after the fact, make changes so that you don't have to deal with as often again in the future the fact that you're just incapable of some things that sometimes you want to accomplish something and you just can't maybe you theoretically could if you knew something differently or had some different ability or access to some different resources but in that moment you don't have it so in that moment you still can't and you got to just do something and move on anyway honestly i like to phrase things in ways that people you know get people's attention and one thing that I absolutely believe is true, but I'm also phrasing it in a way that I think surprises people a little bit so that they'll pay attention is a lot of the time people who are struggling with what most people would call initiation, I think can be explained as those people need to get better at quitting. Because let's think about it. I've intended to start a thing and I'm not initiating it not initiating, not initiating. If we look at that through the deficit model, it's easy enough to say, I struggle with initiation. Whatever the hell initiation is, I am just bad at it. And that's why I'm struggling to initiate. Except you initiate other things all the time without any struggle. So why those particular things, right? Or why in that particular context, particular time, even the thing that you're struggling to initiate on, you might do that thing without problem at other times. And people will say this again, even when they're complaining about saying, I just can't get myself to go. My brain won't let me, my ADHD won't let me, my autism won't let me, whatever it is. I don't have the motivation. I can't, I can't get myself to do a thing that I theoretically conceptually know I am capable of doing, but I can't make myself do it. We're still saying in that moment, like, I don't really know why. I don't know why I can't explain it. My brain just won't let me. If we had a better answer for why, we wouldn't be talking about it as a problem with initiation. If I knew that I couldn't initiate because I am tired and I don't have energy, I wouldn't say I'm struggling to initiate. I would say I'm tired. I need more energy to get started on this thing. So initiation in that way is a lot like laziness and motivation, some of these other words where it is true because we've stipulated that it's true. That's just what the word means, but it doesn't give you much information to do anything with it. So rather than initiation, I find it often more helpful to look at it in that other way. To talk about it as sometimes 
even if I theoretically know, conceptually know what I need to do and how to do it, I might not have the energy I need in order to do it. I might not have access to the sources or the information because knowing and being aware are two different things, right? I know I'm going to die someday. I don't walk around consciously aware, actively thinking about the fact that I am going to inevitably die all day long. That would be awful. And people, I, again, I think this is an important distinction, especially like when I've talked with people who do DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion work, we're just talking about racial justice and that kind of thing. Generally, there's a lot of talking about people aren't aware of X, Y, or Z. And then the response is, no, people know. It, it's been discussed. They have heard about it. They know. Yeah. And they do. Well, they might. They might have alternative explanations that they have been given for the same set of observable facts. That's a big part of the problem recently, especially, of course, always. But uh, they might. They might know it. But knowing something and being aware of it is different. I define, I find it useful to talk about knowing as I am aware of how to get that information, right? Like if you tell me, hey, meet me at such and such place, do you know how to get there? Yeah, I know how to get there. I'm going to plug it into Google Maps. I don't, I, I couldn't go, I'm not aware of the specific steps I could, I would have to take to get there right now unless what I mean is the first step is plug it into Google Maps. So anything that involves systems, especially for recording and accessing information, the reason that those things are useful, that a library is useful, that the internet is useful, is because all that stuff is there and I know the steps of a process that are needed in order to utilize the system and navigate it and find the information that I need. Not that I know everything that's there, and it, I don't know if that, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting off on different things because nobody's in the chat right now, probably because I did not announce this in any kind of a way. And this is more just an exercise for myself, but I do like to do this as consistently as possible. So there's a difference between knowing something and being consciously aware of something. Knowing and being aware of are two different things. So I can know what to do without actually being aware of the specific information I need in order to do it, right? Again, it's it's kind of a joke, or at least it can be, to say, you know, can you cook? I know how to follow a recipe, right? Can you find your way to blank blank? Well, I know how to use Google Maps. Do you know, here's a standard like joke that I've heard a bunch of times, maybe it's relatively unique to like the people I hang out with, but I doubt it. Do you know anything, right? Do you know who was in whatever kind of movie, whatever a standard jokey response is no, but I have this device in my pocket that allows me to access all the collected information of humankind. You know? <laughs> so a lot of what we're talking about is offloading in terms of executive functioning, offloading, offloading means doing something in the environment, creating or utilizing or modifying some environmental thing, a system or whatever, that allows me to take something that I would otherwise be having to do cognitively and stop doing it. So if we automate something, for example, if I need to, I gotta remember at 8.15, I have to leave, right? If I set an alarm, I can stop remembering because now I know well, when my, my system, my way to access the process or navigate the, the process is when an alarm goes off, that means I'm reminding myself to do something. And at that point, alarm goes off. What am I supposed to do? It's 8.15. Ah, now I can remember what I'm supposed to do. Or if not, if it's even busier than that, and it is a lot of the time, I uh, put stuff in my calendar, right? The alarm goes off. It's not just an alarm and I have to remember what the alarm's for. It's the alarm goes off and it says, do this thing, or you have this client in 10 minutes or whatever it is. So that's a form of offloading. All of this stuff is offloading. And yes, people will say, well, do you, do you think kids these days are worse at remembering stuff because of the internet and blah, blah, blah. To whatever extent they are, it is appropriate, not inappropriate, right? Why would you want, if we take person X, 
And at first they're in a context in which they have access to none of the information that they need to use on a routine basis. Well, then it becomes very, very important for that person to spend a good chunk of their limited resources as much as is necessary to carry that information around with them in their head. But then if we put them in a new context where now they have access to that information externally anytime they need, all they need to know is how to navigate a system, you know, how to search, you know, enter something into the search field or whatever it is, right? Why would we want that person to spend the same amount of their resources carrying information around in their head? It's not to say that it's not worth carrying any information around in your head. I don't think that's even possible anyway. It's just why carry information that you can access when you need to around in your head? Honestly, I think I'm really just going all over the place, but nobody's here asking me things. Uh, the joke question that everybody references of teacher, why do we need to learn math? Well, because you won't always have a calculator in your pocket when you're grown up, right? Which now those of us who were given that answer when we were young can look back and be like, Haha, ha, jokes on you. I do carry a calculator around in my pocket. But even if we didn't, it's still a bad answer. Why do I need to learn math? Because you won't have a calculator. Okay, but that doesn't answer the question. That's like saying, why do I need to learn how to just, you know, fly by willing it to be so with my body? Well, because you won't always have a parachute. I don't always need to utilize math, right? So they're saying when you need to use math, you may not have a calculator on you. But the question still stands, okay, well, then when would I need to use math? Why is it worth doing all of this? What are the situations, the scenarios that you are predicting will happen in my life in which it will be beneficial to me? And I'll say, oh, thank goodness I learned how to do this when I was a kid, right? They're not answering that question because partly we teach math terribly. We teach it not as a system or a way of looking at things, not as a language but as a series of memorized steps and formula, right? I think math is wonderful for people to learn as a language, as a way of dealing with reality, of taking information and making it, and plugging it into a system that makes it easier to carry complicated things around in small packages. It's good that I can multiply instead of just having to count each individual one. But even if I just count it, that's still math. I'm still counting. So it's good to learn that language, to learn that way of like being able to process information. But does, does it matter that I specifically remember Pythagorean theorem? No, probably not. How many of you, honestly, outside of your work, and even if it is, if you're using it in work, it's in limited fields, right? But Outside of work, how many of you have actually used Pythagorean theorem? And this is a basic one, like a base level. We're not talking about advanced calculus and all that kind of stuff. How many of you have used Pythagorean theorem in your life since you stopped going to school, since you left the academic environment? Even if you're using it in work, it's within a very narrow range of employment. Most of you have not used it. So why do we teach it to kids? Why is it so important? I think math should be looked at the same way that reading is looked at, although we teach reading terribly too, which is we're giving people the ability to observe and organize information in a particular way. Doing that in the way you do it with math is different than doing that in the way that you do it with reading. We don't teach reading, well, we kind of do, but we shouldn't teach reading. <laughs> as though what we're telling people is, these are the certain words and the arrangements of them that you need to know, right? Read this book, that book, this book, this story, that poem, and now you're done. We teach reading as a way to access information. If you know how to read, then you can unlock the information that is locked behind what otherwise would be just nonsense marks on a page, right? No matter what you read, there's some language you don't read you look at something written in that language, it means nothing to you. If you learn that language, it means a lot to you. Math is the same way, but it's taught as though all you need to do are memorize certain ways of using certain numbers and certain formulas instead of just a way to approach the world. And of course, that's not true across the board. There are plenty of great, brilliant math teachers out there who teach it as a language, 
but even they are often constrained by the curriculum. They have to, just like reading, right? Even if I want to teach reading the way that I think reading should be taught, which is as a way to access information, and therefore, if that's really what I'm going for, the most effective way to do that would be to get people, to give people an idea of the kinds of information that they would want to have that are locked away behind those symbols on the page that they can get if only they learn to read. In other words, I would want to build my entire curriculum around people reading in order to get information or have experiences that they want, not that I'm saying that they should have. But if the curriculum says, well, sure, but how are we going to test? How are we going to, we have to have them all read the same book. Otherwise, how are we going to have any kind of a comparison? Because that's what state level tests and I'll help the ACT and the SAT and all that stuff. That's what they are is a way to compare and contrast people to rank them one against another. And you can't do that very well in any kind of large scale statistical way unless everybody has somewhat similar experiences, which is another part of the flaw, right? Like even if theoretically every person in eighth grade has been assigned by their teacher to read, what do we read in eighth grade? I don't know, uh, The Old Man in the Sea, maybe. That sounds about right, that age, maybe. Uh, even if theoretically every child has been assigned that by their teacher and gone through lesson plans with their teacher, well, all those teachers are different and all those lessons are different and all those kids are different and all the context is different. Some of those kids go home and their parents have plenty of time and they all sit down on the couch and read together. And some of those kids go home and their parents are working three jobs and there's nobody to support them. Some of those kids don't go home, they go work or they go, you know. So the idea that we can take things and we can take people, children especially, and rank them against each other by just making sure that they all have access to the same stuff. And then let's see how they do with it. And those who do better with it, we assign, oh, you're better. And those who do worse, we say you're worse. Of course, it's never going to work. And of course, we know that. I mean, a lot of people know that anyway. A lot of people are working on bringing awareness to the fact that these scores correlate to race. These scores correlate to, well, as one admissions, like career long university admissions person put it, that the most predictive factor in a person's educational outcome is their zip code. But we just, we want the, I'm getting real political today. I don't know. Maybe it's a good day to do it. Maybe there aren't people here really watching. what we want with these things is not actually to compare people in any meaningful way is to create a, a valid enough illusion that there is some meaning behind the comparisons we're putting right we cannot make a test that actually compares two people's ability to understand a text we can't because all a test can do is measure your ability to do what the test is asking you to do under the conditions in which you have been asked to take the test. It's a very narrow scope, right? So of course, we're not actually trying to rank people in any meaningful kind of way. What we're trying to do is say, we have outcomes, some of which are more desirable than others, and it's finite, and only so many people can have the more desirable outcomes by design, and only so many people, well, and everybody else has the worst outcomes or whatever. We need to give some explanation for why the people with the better outcomes have the better outcomes. Screw it. I'm just going full on political today. I don't care. I'm like trying to moderate myself. I don't care. Why? Why not? Why not be full, authentic, invisible, and whatever? Just to be clear, I, I now I feel like I set that up badly. I don't try to moderate it because I'm trying to hide anything that I believe. I'm trying to moderate it generally because that's not why people are here. You're not coming here to talk about politics. You to come in here theoretically to talk about executive functioning and neurodiversity and how the brain works and all that kind of stuff. But I think that stuff is intrinsically linked to this stuff. It really is. I don't, I don't think there's a way to really deeply understand the things that we're talking about in terms of executive functioning and cognition and the brain and the body and all that stuff and come to vastly different conclusions about political systems and other things. And if you think that how your school was constructed, how it was run, the messaging that you got, the 
content that you were presented and the way in which it was presented and the way in which you were tested and the messages you were given about what those results meant. If you don't think that that has a huge impact on everything that you think and do, you just haven't looked very closely at it. It's a system that we put every single child in this country into, theoretically. There are opt-outs, but they're not super easy. And it is legal, right? Like legally, you are required to put your children into this system. And I'm not I'm not saying, hey, pull your kids out of school and teachers are terrible and education is not the what I'm saying is you lived and breathed this stuff from in almost all cases in America, age five to age 18 at least. A lot of you did it earlier and later and even a lot, lot later than that. You go to therapy and talk about childhood experiences and everybody talks about the family and the parents and, and all that stuff is important. Well, where does a six-year-old spend the bulk of their day most of the year? If we're gonna acknowledge that early experiences, formative experiences are so impactful to people later on in ways that you can't really understand, but you can unpack and kind of look at some correlations and connections that might be useful, why are we not emphasizing education in that way more than we currently are? Why is it all about the family? Anyway, just ranting today. I don't know. I'm having fun, I guess. Yeah. All it really is at the end of it, as constructed, right? This all works backwards. What's the final goal of education in America? is to sort out people going to college and people not going to college. And even people going to college or not going to college or going to this college versus that college or studying this thing versus that thing is ultimately just about employment and occupation and access to money and power. And it's all designed backwards from there. Every single, not every single, I shouldn't say that. I firmly believe that the vast, vast, vast majority of educators and students and administrators, every individual is doing amazing work their intentions i love their intentions and the way that they execute them i love the way that they execute them but they still only have choices within constraints and it's the constraints that we want to focus on the system this isn't a criticism of teachers or of education as an idea or a, this is a criticism of particular pieces of the, the education system as currently constructed that we could theoretically change and i think would be worth changing that it would be an improvement to change. I, I want to be clear. I, I don't know that I always do a great job of being clear about the distinction between systems analysis and individuals, which by the way, a lot of what we're talking about when we talk about executive functioning is just looking at yourself as a system because you are. A system means many individual pieces working together in concert towards some particular end. It means that the outcome, the output of a system, even if every single individual element is doing exactly what it is supposed to do and the best that it can, that the way that the system is constructed, the way that those elements have been set up to interact with one another, that even if they're all doing the best, we still get outcomes that are undesirable. Even if every teacher is brilliant and wonderful, we still get undesirable outcomes. And that's frustrating to look at especially as somebody in the system who's trying to do your best and then being confronted with the fact that no matter what, you're still going to get stuff that you don't like coming out of this because it's a systems level problem. And that is true of you, that even if you do everything exactly the best you can optimally, you have the best, most optimal, most efficient, most effective, most appropriate thoughts and behaviors, and you're still going to get outcomes that you don't like because of the way that the system is constructed. People are generally, not generally, people often are opposed to that idea because it's more comforting to think of it as though everything we do is in our control. That if I want to try to do something, I can. And if I want to try and do something and I don't or I fail, it's just because I didn't try and do it in the right way. I got to learn something new or practice something or whatever. It's never that I could not do it no matter what. I don't like that, right? But your system, in fact, depending on the level you want to look at, a cell is a system, right? You have what we call a nervous system, a cardiac system, right? Like you have a digestive system in you. 
it's the way the pieces interact, not what each, each individual piece is doing. So I just want to clarify that, that that's what I'm talking about. It's not about individuals. It's about the way the system was constructed. And even that, it made sense. Every piece that was developed made sense in the context in which it was developed, but then context changes. A perfect example of this in education. Early American universities were primarily designed for two professions, medicine and law. And at the time in which it was designed and first implemented, what did somebody who learns medicine, somebody who is a doctor have to do? They had to go to where the people were. They had to make house calls. They had to go to the, the homestead, the farmstead, whatever. And they could carry nothing with them but the bag. So they did need information in their head. And the best doctors theoretically would be those ones who carried more information than other doctors did and could diagnose things that other doctors would be like, well, I don't know what this is. Let's just cut it off, I guess. You know, It was important to memorize. Rote memorization and access to that was important in that context. I don't know if you've been to the doctor or not lately, but usually when you go to the doctor these days, they have a computer in the room where you're waiting and often as you describe their symptom, your symptoms, they will enter the symptoms into the computer and the computer will return a diagnosis, including step-by-step -step instructions. I one time over a decade ago went to the doctor to talk about something that was unusual, but turned out to not be like problematic. It's just a thing that happens sometimes. It's not a big deal, but I didn't know that. I wanted to get checked out. I didn't know if it was connected to some bigger thing, right? And saw what the doctor had entered. And what the computer was saying literally was, okay, this is what it is. It's not an issue and there's not really anything you can do about it. It just, you got to wait it out. So here's what you do. Reassure the patient that, well, like literally the computer was saying, reassure the patient that this is not a serious condition or whatever, right? So is rote memorization as important now as it was back then? No. Is it not important at all? I'm not saying that. It's still faster. If I have information in my head that I've memorized and organized so that I can access it, it's much faster if I have that in here than if I have to go look it up on the computer or in a book or whatever. So it's not that there's no benefit to it, especially when it comes to problem solving and creative problem solving. The more information I have access to, the quicker I can rearrange and rearrange and rearrange. But it's not the be all end all that it was. And one of my uh, favorite, well, I was going to say professors as a shorthand. They were never actually my professor. Bill Kincaid, awesome guy. Uh, he taught, I don't know if he still does, but he used to teach at Western Illinois University. He taught theater and did a lot of really cool stuff with what he calls original practices, Shakespeare. This is, I'm just, I'm plugging to zero people. <laughs> Bill Kincaid is cool. Anyway, he said to me, because someone had said to him that the reason that we have to take classes like the history of theater is because the university system was designed for scientists and lawyers and doctors and later on artists wanted to glom on and we had to follow the rules and the format that had been established for those professions and that in an alternate universe where the universities had been developed for the arts and then later on the sciences and medicine and whatever they wanted to come in in that alternate universe they would have to take you know Civil engineering as expressed through dance or you know, the emotional process of designing a bridge or I don't know, whatever kind of thing. It's just the methodology. So these things make sense when they're de developed, but then the context changes and they no longer make sense. But humans, cognitive miser, right? Why would I examine something that I'm doing that doesn't cause a problem? In fact, why would I even notice something that I'm doing that doesn't cause a problem? It's something I have always done. It's the fish, right? Two young fish swimming along, older fish passes by and says, hey kids, how's the water treating you? And they go their separate ways and a moment later, one of the young fish turns to the other and says, what's water? It's just how it's done. You don't question it. That's why I love little facts that break people's narratives and images of how things work. Like, oh, why does the American school system take the summer off? If anybody was here in the chat, I would ask you, I would say, tell me, what, why do American schools not 
have classes over the summer? Many people will just say, I don't know. That's just how it is because they haven't thought of it at all. Most people who have an answer beyond I don't know will say, because that's when schools were founded in America and the system was first started. That's when people, you know, the kids worked on the farm and they took the summer off so that the kids could work on the farm and then they came back in the fall. That's a nice little narrative, just like the idea that if you both read Old Man and the Sea and then both take the same test, we can have a good comparison one against the other that means something. It's it makes enough sense. It sounds right enough to say, yeah, OK, that sounds right. I'm going to move along. But if anybody was here in the chat, when's the busy season on a farm? Have you ever farmed? Do you know anybody who farms? Even if you don't, you know stories about farming. When are the busy times on the farm? Planting and harvesting, which happen in the spring and in the fall. And in fact, summer is one of the least busy times on a farm. So that explanation doesn't make sense if you look at it very closely. The explanation isn't designed to make sense if you look at it closely. It's designed to make sense enough to stop you from looking any closer. The real reason that American schools take the summer off, because, I don't know why I'm doing this, but it's fun. Because we didn't used to have air conditioning. And so summer, when it's hot in temperate climates, which a large part of America is, but even in the parts that aren't as temperate, the summer is still much hotter than the other parts of the year. When it's hot in the summer, and you don't have air conditioning, being in the city sucks. There's lots of people, lots of big buildings, lots of reflection, lots of just heat generated. It is hot and dirty and gritty. And so if you have the ability to get out of the city over the summer, you do. And you all know this because it's in popular media. We just mostly talk about it in England, the city estate and the country estate because the city is where everybody's gathered and all the cool cultural things can happen because we're condensing the population. So, so much can happen in a very small geographic area, but that's also very hot and uncomfortable in the summer. So we all go to our country estates. In America, a lot of this is a lake house. How many of your families have a lake house that maybe you go to for a week out of the year? And my wife, her family has two. Her dad's family has one. Her mom's family has one especially in the Midwest, right? That, so I'm not trying to like, I was at the lake last week. I talked to you guys about that on the stream, right? These days, mostly people are going for about a week at a time and think of it that kind of way, but it doesn't make sense to buy a second house that you're gonna visit one week out of the year. These families bought the lake houses back at a time when what they were doing was going up for the summer, right? As soon as it started getting hot, May, June, we go up. We come back down when it starts to cool down, end of August, September. Hey, when does the school year end and when does the school year start? So not everybody can get out of the city, but the people who can get out of the city said, uh, stop school. We don't want you doing stuff when we're not there. So just pause so we can go be comfortable at the lake house or at the country estate. We'll be back in August or September and we can resume from there. That's why American schools take the summer off. It has nothing to do with farms. Because again, not again, but just, I don't know. <laughs> what is power? Power is the ability to change things to suit your needs, your purposes, your whims, your desires. The more power you have, the greater your capacity to change the environment in such a way that it is what you want it to be, right? Nobody has infinite power and nobody has no power, but we have more or less. It varies from one person to the next. It also varies for a particular person from one context to the next. In one context, you might be very powerful. In another context, you might have no very little power, right? But power is the ability to make things be the way that you want them to be. So anything that is large scale and has existed for a long time is beneficial to people with the most power and who've had it the longest. It doesn't mean that you are a bad person for benefiting from the way that things are because it's been established that way. 
it has nothing to do with an individual. That's the point of systems. Look, like people will ask me because I'm mixed race and I often spend a lot of time in, in spaces that are mostly white. I'll be the only non-white person in a space that so people will ask me all the time. Do you think it's racist if X or do you think this person was racist or whatever? And my answer every time is I don't care. I don't care. Why would I care? I don't care about the individual. I care about the system. Because even if every individual is as they often claim to be, doesn't have a racist bone in their body, racism still is a thing. And there are still very disparate outcomes for people of different races. I don't care about the individual when we're talking about things like this. It's a systems level. But yes, how is the school structure? Why is school structured the way that it is? Because it benefited powerful people. That's always going to be the answer for anything big because it benefited powerful people and or continues to benefit powerful people. Why do we still have a lot of the, like when people talk about getting rid of summer break, a lot of what comes up, well, but families take trips over the summer and tourism dollars would be impacted and all that stuff. Yeah, the families with the money to take trips, take their trips over the summer. But a lot of families don't have money. In fact, a lot of kids get most of their food from school and over summer when school stops, have access to less food. Summer, the idea of summer is, ah, get out into nature. Not everybody lives in or near nature and has the resources necessary to travel whatever distance it takes to get from where they live to where nature is. It's the same thing that bothers me when people say things like, hey, listen, get off the computer, put down the phone, put down the video game and go outside, run around and play. That's great when you're outside is nature and the suburbs or whatever. It's terrible when outside is a war zone or when outside is a blisteringly hot city street or an area where gangs are fighting over territory. It is not safe for everyone. That's a very, I'm trying to avoid using certain language. I don't know why. Anyway, if you're ever asking why is something the way that it is, and it's something that's large scale, not individual, something that's affected by systems, the answer has to be some version of because it benefited the people with the most power at the point at which it was constructed that way. So no, why would we build the school system about what helps farmers the most? Although it's not like farmers have no power or have traditionally have had no power, but compared to the landed aristocracy, uh, it's time to end, which is probably good. I don't know why. I'm not embarrassed or ashamed of sharing these things. I just... I guess I think I'm indulging myself because I find it interesting and helpful to talk about stuff in this way. But my mental image, the concept I'm making up of the people who might be here is that they're not really interested in that. So I feel a little selfish, I suppose, or guilty for talking about something I think is interesting and actually do think is helpful. But nothing is helpful if the person that it's intended to be helpful to doesn't think it's helpful. They won't pay attention. That's just a waste. So I guess I feel a little selfish, not like embarrassed. And I guess I'm embarrassed about feeling selfish, but this stuff matters. Like you're shaped by this stuff. You think your internal sense of, for example, hard work is important. Where does that come from? That idea is not intrinsic. Does it map to reality? Or I guess the better question is to what extent does it model reality and where does it fall short? If hard work equals success, why would anyone want to be successful? You just have to work harder, right? The harder you work, the more successful you are. If that's the correlation, it means the more successful you are, the harder you're working. And they sell that lie. Oh, man, these billionaires are very, very hardworking. Then why do you want it? What's the point of the success if your life only gets harder? It seems more like something that's designed to be an answer that makes enough sense to stop people from looking more closely. I'm going to stop. I got to go. <laughs> Good to be with you guys. I don't know. Today was what it was. Next week, I'll be back Thursday, 1 p.m. Central Time to 2 p.m. Central Time. After that, we'll be back to the regular Wednesday, 1 p.m. Central Time to 2 p.m. And maybe there will be more people so that there will be questions in the chat and I won't just get off on things that aren't really, you know, within the purview of what we're, what it is. It's just not. I don't think that's what people are 
comment here to here, I guess is all I mean. Anyway, thank you, any of you who are watching this or who watch this after the fact. Thanks for sticking with me. I hope it was, if nothing else, at least entertaining. Uh, be well.